Hi there. This is an interview between myself, Anna Markey, and a guy called Chaz, an American volunteer in Ukraine. Now, originally, this video was supposed to start with just a little skit that likely mocked the American stereotypes. I was going to ramble on about apple pie and fireworks and monster trucks and why anyone would want to leave America and go to Ukraine. But then something happened. Gonzalo Lira, host of the infamous Vatnik Roundtable, who I famously debated some time ago, to which I owe a huge part of my notoriety to, while in prison in Ukraine awaiting trial, died. Now I bring this up because this interview was recorded back in December when he was alive and we do mention him. Now naturally, because of my connections to Gonzalo Lira, people have been asking me for my opinion, and a lot of the opinions I previously gave on him are being misquoted or stated out of context. So I'm going to let the interview play, but if you stick around to the end, I'd like to share some thoughts with you. But first, are you ready to fuck Putin? Not like that, like this. Yes, thanks to my good friends at SignMyRocket.com, you too can leave a personalized greeting for Putin. SignMyRocket will take anything you want, write your name on it, and then take a video of them firing it at the Russians. Whatever you want, grenades, shells, even jets, for money. And use that money to buy more shit to throw at the Russians. It's the perfect gift for weddings, birthdays, the mitzvahs, or a girl's night out. And what could be more romantic than dropping to your knee in front of your best girl, or man, or squid creature, I don't judge, and proclaiming, Baby, will you make me the happiest man slash woman slash squid creature by writing slurs in a 150 millimeter artillery shell so the last thing a Russian invader sees is me calling him a piss goblin? Oh yes, of course, darling. We shall do it together as a couple. The ultimate gesture of romance and they live happily ever after. So, <laughs> where, where does Laser Pig come from, man? I gotta know. There seems like there should be a story there. Uh, what, the name? Yeah. Uh, the name comes from a, a kind of weird... It's it's a kind of weird explanation as to what Russia did to America during the the Soviet Union, and then I kind of play on that. So um, one of the things the Soviets used to love doing was like hyping up what their technology could do. It's like we've got the uh, most powerful things in the universe, <laughs> and they can fire lasers and shoot down satellites and go Mach nine, that kind of shit. And then you'd have all these dumbass experts on like yeah. late night. TV in America going, well, this just proves that, you know, right. Russia's superior to us in every way. We can't we can't deal with it. So the, what the U.S. military would do is it would get together, spend a bajillion pan, uh, dollars, and then yeah. build a space laser. And then, <laughs> and then Russia would go, oh, no, we've accidentally advanced military technology by 30 years, and now we're 120 <laughs> years behind everybody else. Crap. Um, okay. And that was, no. called, that was called laser bear syndrome. It's like yeah, Russia claims uh, it's invented a laser bear. Uh, the U.S. goes, "Oh, we can't. We have no defense against laser bears. We need to build a laser bear of our own." And that comes in. Blah blah blah. Laser <laughs> pig comes from that. That, that. that sounds like a fever dream. Like, oh, we don't have laser bears. We got to come up with something to match it. Yeah, I love how, <laughs> I love how of your entire backstory for your name is yep. literally the is literally the carbon copy story. Of the F fifteen, yet you've not made a video about the F fifteen. I'm working on it. Okay, it's complicated. I have, I have documents. Uh, I have boxes full of documents that were sent to me from the Pentagon. Because I, I sent, I, I sent a Freedom of Information request to the Pentagon asking about oh. um, the fighter mafia's involvement in the F fifteen Project Redbird and everything. And I said, "What can you send me?" And they just went, "Here, have this." Boxes of documents <laughs> arrive. This shit is complicated. This is one of the most complicated things I've ever looked at. This is insane. Well, you're, you're, doing better, you're doing better than me on my ever-engaging war against the history of uh, Russian and Soviet aviation. I mean, oh, I'm, God. I'd... Uh, uh, like I'm trying to like I, I own both books on the Su-57 that exist. Oh, <laughs> that's oh. such a joke of an aircraft. Oh, you don't like, know half of it. I, so, I I don't. Well, yeah, especially if you've yeah got two it, books there. I got one book, which is by a photographer and an aviation enthusiast 
who I think is a Russian expat in the US. Mm -hmm. So he's a bit more balanced. Right. But the other guy is Yefrim Gordon, the official historian of the Russian Air Force. Mm -hmm. And like, it's so fun reading his books, especially on the classic Soviet aircraft. It's like, ah, yes, the MiG-15 shot down 3,000 sabers. Yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, okay. It was a completely indigenous Soviet design. There was no stealing of technology from the Germans at all. And then the yeah. same guy. Yes, all us, all us. The same guy who they got the design documents from from Fockerwolf who made the TA mm -hmm. the TA series Kurt Tank this designer he goes to Argentina for completely unrelated reasons yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and works for Juan Peron and he's like okay boys I brought this design with me from my old days at Fockerwolf and uh, I can adapt it to modern technology have we got an engine yeah we've got the Rolls Royce Neen from the UK because Argentina was friends with Britain at the time mm -hmm. just so happens that the Brits sold that same engine to the Soviets and said, <laughs> okay, you can only use it in airliners. Right. You're wink, not wink, allowed to copy it. Yeah. You're not allowed to copy it. We'll be very upset. And so the Soviets immediately um, counted the rivets and, you know, made a right. Klimov variant of the Rolls-Royce Neen. So you have two, uh, two aircraft built around the same engine, mm -hmm. right? You're wrong. Yeah. And, you're, the Soviets are like, ah, oh, yes, this is there, completely. In, it's like you're know, completely <laughs> <indigenous> <laughs> design. Yeah, we got some technology assistance from the Germans because we found their their stuff. But on the whole, we designed this like it was based on a rocket plane from like 1942, and it's great. <laughs> and then you put the the German design from Argentina and the MiG-15, and they're almost exactly the same. They had the same engine and the same like in, like they are to, from the same design template. They yeah, just a near carbon <laughs> copy. Yeah, the only difference is that Kurt Tank switched to a high mounted wing and T tail, whereas the uh, Soviets couldn't get their aerofoil to work po properly. So what they did was they mid mounted it and put a Mac mm. fence halfway down the wing to stop it from going supersonic and breaking off. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so <laughs> they go through all that effort and the Argentinian knockoff quotation marks is actually faster but uh, Juan Peron <laughs> went broke and the prototype crashed because couldn't control angle of attack that's a whole other story but anyway yeah <laughs> too many so, rabbit holes yeah yeah but that's the point my, my script started out as let's talk about the SU-57 and I'm 10 pages in and I'm like oh this is going to be two videos isn't it <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah every time <laughs> Every fucking time. <laughs> you can't start with an explanation of just how bad that plane is without going over the entire history of the Soviet Union's right? aviation development. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm, of flight. Yeah, you have to I'm on page thing. 10 of this script, my dude. I'm on page 10, and I am just hitting World War II-era Soviet planes. I'm not <laughs> even in the jets yet. Jesus. <laughs> So the jets are probably going to be a second part, and then the SU-57. <laughs> it's it's going to be a trilogy. you got to buy the yeah. trilogy. The trilogy, um, <laughs> Star Wars opening crawls, the whole shebang. <laughs> I, it, the, the funny thing is, I go through all this effort, and the best joke in this is still just a sight gag, which is it starts off as Russian Aviation 101, and then halfway down page four, there's just like Russian Aviation 101, and Russian is just crossed out with red paint, and Soviet Aviation 101, <laughs> just graffiti next to it. Oh, <laughs> turns out shooting all your business owners and uh, engineers uh, makes yeah. building planes hard. Yeah, that that it. Yeah, <laughs> bit of a brain drain. Bit of a brain drain. I've been told. Yeah. Oh no, everyone was happy. No one. No one was <laughs> playing, right? Oh, absolutely <laughs> not. Why would Why would anyone leave Russia? <laughs> yeah, right. You can have yeah, an yeah. indoor yeah. toilet in Russia if you live <laughs> in Moscow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, all twelve hours of its summer is just beautiful. You know. <laughs> <laughs> the you roads know, in Russia work perfectly. Yeah, yeah right. But it, <laughs> yeah, it's a nice cold. It's a fun cold. No, no, um, no. The, it's it's just one of those things. As I said, when at the start of this whole fracas, it started in well, the original one in 2014, but the big invasion started in February. I'm like, guys, 
guys, this the, is it's the recipe. It's 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 when the mud melts. Yeah. It's the only reason you survived the yeah. last big war. Why are yeah. you? What, what are you Dude, doing? That I can't. I'm so glad. Like I have, have this conversation all the time. It's like it fucked Napoleon up. Uh, sorry, screwed Napoleon up, screwed the Nazis up, and now you're literally going in February. Like how's just the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. Like Are you already recording, believe. Pig? I'm, by I'm the way, I'm recording this. This is all going okay. in. Okay. Sorry, I, didn't, I, I don't. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't know the rules on the. Curse, we're just. So we're I just gonna. Uh, we we can bleep. We okay. can bleep. It's all up That's to U twenty four. Actually, what do you think, Eugene? Is he allowed to say naughty words? It's it's totally up to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, uh, I like the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, I, I know. I know. Ginny and them have let it sneak in a few times. So. I don't know. Uh, I think it'll be you know what? You've been in the Ukrainian army, so you've probably picked up yeah. a few Ukrainian swear words. Okay. Oh, so, yeah. so let's think about this. We have a drunk Scotsman, an Australian who shouldn't be awake in this hour, and a <laughs> salty veteran who's just come back from a war zone. Like if we if we are still monetized, <laughs> if we're still monetized, I think we failed, quite frankly. <laughs> quite, to be honest. <laughs> At this point, we failed because we're just lying. <laughs> we actually are propaganda because it's like it's gotta be propaganda. There's it's gotta not be, nearly, it's gotta enough, be. Not <laughs> nearly <laughs> enough abuse being hurled. <laughs> it's clearly propaganda, but we're just not being paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> right, you yeah. from the ad <laughs> we're getting yeah. ready. We're getting from the ad revenue, <laughs> which we won't get. Which we won't get. <laughs> we, won't get. <laughs> we can't fucking. There you nothing. go. <laughs> At least you're getting something from the activities. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I've started like showing up in like different live chats on different things, and it's always like. You know, you'll find one of the Vatnik bots out there. Yeah. And they'll, and they'll see me yeah. and be like, hey, Anamarki, how's that propaganda grind going? <laughs> I, I, I joined a freaking gaming stream last night and one of those Vatnik Are you serious? Out, yeah. They're everywhere. And I'm just like, I mean, it's, I've it's heard like of the Russian version of Karen's. Yeah, that reminds like, me of, you know? I've heard of multi spectrum warfare, but this is just <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> It, sh it shows where Russia's got its priorities right now, you know? <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, the tanks are falling oh. apart. Most men are going out there into the, the mud and the cold without proper equipment. Half of them don't have boots. Some of them only got like one or two clips in their gun. They don't even have any heavy equipment left anymore. Yeah. But we need more bots to it's annoy true. gamers and annoying people on the <laughs> internet. Yeah, actually, right. you've, you've probably seen that. You've probably seen that they've um like the Kremlin has actually authorized, and I'm I'm not even hi using hyperbole here. Uh, they've started creating fake NAFO fella accounts, yes, with yeah. explicitly like Ukrainian nationalist and sort of mm -hmm. you know question spicy pinwheel symbols as I call them, like all over the place. Spicy like, pinwheel, yes, yeah, yeah, and they're like. <laughs> And then you look at their accounts. They were all created like a week ago. Oh, and then yeah. you look at what they're posting and they're like, ah, yes, I'm out here to go murder children. I am so happy. I'm just like, <laughs> you, you're going to put some more effort in for it. Like, <laughs> you, yeah. <laughs> Who, what, what, what it worries me more is that there's actually people going to be out there and look at that and go, yeah, that's exactly what a human being was right. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just here to kill the kids. I'm here for that and that only. <laughs> Uh, so every idiots. every now and then you get other gems like uh i saw i i don't know i think it was one of the uh ukrainian units posted this footage they had they dubbed it with the soundtrack from guardians of the galaxy which i thought was pretty funny there's drones flying on recon patrol and they just find this one russian mobic he doesn't have a rifle he's just got his backpack on and he's walking home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, he's just leaving he's just fucking booking it that dude is walking <laughs> a thousand kilometers straight to Russia no fucks given he's gone he is Huckleberry and Finn on a fucking adventure the right drone to stops and just looks at him and he looks to the drone and he like waves <laughs> yeah, and he's he like even care. He, he waves at the drone and he's like he waves at the drone and gestures like I'm going home and just like leaves <laughs> it, <laughs> it, and, it, and it's the way he waves at it too he waves at it like a little kid like it was his dad flying the drone you know and they're on their first camping trip together <laughs> like hi dad it's like hi guys yeah. it's like, but man uh, pfft, dude like yeah, probably they would all do that oh yeah right and then you got Shoiko's yeah. like Storm Z propaganda coming. Like, Look at this. We're going to be, we've got Storm Z. We're going to win. It's, yeah. 
Man, oh, yeah. God. Should, anyway, we should probably we should probably do what we're here for. Right? Yeah, we should. Yeah, right. Oh, let's, I thought this off. was the whole show. I thought it was us yeah. just have, have a weird conversation. <laughs> no, no, it's I technically an interview. We have oh, questions. Okay. <laughs> oh, we got questions for you, man. Hang on, let me turn on the light there so I get the interrogation feel. There Take it away, Mr. Scottish interview man. We have questions for you. <laughs> you for we ask the, the questions. questions. <laughs> All right. Okay. okay. Well, you know what? Start, start, start. Let's start casual. <laughs> Tell us a little right. bit about yourself. Tell us about like your life in America, what you did like, like pre-Ukraine war and everything. Okay. Yeah. Um, so obviously, you know, Chaz Gluff is my name. Um, I'm from Kansas in the U.S. Uh, I was six years U.S. Navy from 03 to 09, so I've been out a while. And currently, I still own my own business back in the States. Uh, we basically help small machine shops get work from DOD, you know, companies like Lockheed Martin, Raytheon, um, Northrop Grumman, L3 Harris, that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's a, that's, that's a pretty decent gig. Question. Yeah. Oh three oh nine in the navy. What were you doing? Uh, yeah, I was. I were. I was on submarines. I did four tours on submarines as well as a tour in Iraq. I went over there as what was called an IA or an individual augmentee. And so essentially, what we did is at the time, um, army troop or yeah, army soldiers were doing like fifteen month rotations in country and. What they did is they asked some of the other services like the navy. It's like, hey, would you volunteer to do a six month stint? Um, in place of some of these, you know, 11, some of these infantrymen. Um, so that way they can kind of get their time reduced uh, in country down to maybe nine months or 10 months. So I went ahead and volunteered and did one of those as well. Wait, so you went from, you went from like, you went from submarines to an 11 mm -hmm. Bravo? Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. <laughs> yeah. They would stay. Man. Yeah. So <laughs> I, yeah, I did all the sub to training within that. There's a lot of uh, CQB, SRF kind of stuff. Um, because you know that's I was part of the you know security teams uh, that you know oh, watch okay. out for nuclear weapons and all this. So then, essentially, what they did, they sent us over to South Carolina, and we did uh, kind of a like a compressed boot camp, essentially for like an eleven, kind of like a school of infantry. Because you know we didn't really need to learn the ranks and the marching, and it was mostly just that actual infantry skill set that uh, you know we needed to be taught. So we were taught that, then went to Kuwait, uh, practiced convoys and things like that in Kuwait, then over to Iraq, I went. Ooh, Damn. Iraq in like, Iraq in like 08, 09, like around that time? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back when it was, back when it was fun, man. Back when it was oh, fun. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, have to, I, have Proper. To ask, I have to ask, how high did you get? <laughs> how high did I get? <laughs> Uh, I've seen the pictures. <laughs> I don't know. More of an Afghanistan thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, the poppy fields. No, they uh, they they do. They love their hashish over there, man, and they get mad at you if you don't uh, smoke with them. So yeah, it's may or may not have happened. There's there's a reason why they don't drug test you in country. I'll I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. You know? we, we don't need to know. It's fine. Yeah. We, we don't need to know that much. Don't worry about the man behind the curtain. Yeah, you know. Oh my god! Seriously, so, that's but, that's rough. Going from submarines into yeah. like into like surge era Iraq, man. Yeah, that's it was awesome. it's totally different. <laughs> to totally different. But uh, you know, glad glad I did it too because. Uh, it really kind of let me get my own personal opinions of what was going on in that country at the time. And, uh, you know, I guess build a better sense of what's really going on under there. Cause I really believe like, if you want to have an opinion on something, you really need to go there to have an opinion on it. So that yeah. was, uh, yeah. So I was good, very thankful to be able that's to That's a good point to have. That's a know. good position to have. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's, you know, people ask me all the time, you know, like, not getting like the Israel Gaza thing. It's like I stay out of it because I don't know anything about it. I'm not Jewish. I'm not a Muslim. This isn't my country. Like I have, I have nothing to do with this. I don't want anything to do with this. You know, it's a fair point to have. To be honest, man. If only everyone was just as circumspect. <laughs> I hope you're not. I hope. I hope after you got off the front line, you didn't go on Twitter. Don't go there. Just, no, just no, don't don't no. go there. It's, it's, Dude, don't even have a Twitter place. account, man. Yeah, <laughs> you're a lucky man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think our friend. But, yeah, feel sorry Go for ahead. some of us that actually have to have a Twitter account for. Oh yeah, yeah. social media <laughs> presence. God, yeah. uh, the media. Think, uh, 
Yes. I think our friend Remy has I think our friend Remy said it best. I hate my decisions for choosing a job where I have to have a Twitter account. I think that's uh, <laughs> that's in his Twitter bio. So I gotta give a shout out to Remy for that. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> oh man, but yeah. wow. submarines to a rock. That would yeah. have been a hell of an acclimatization period. What was that yeah. like? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's different, you know. Uh because you know, basically you're you know breathing in recycled farts and everything is exactly what it is in a submarine, you know, there's, I mean, you know, you can, you can control the entire everything, you know, from the temperature to how much humidity is in the air. I mean, everything, you know, how much carbon, everything to, yeah, the desert where they're just burning everything plastic in a big pit right outside where you live and 130 degree weather and all that. So yeah, it's, you're talking, yeah, a night and day kind of scenario, night and day. Jeez. Oh. So you're yeah. on the security team for nuclear weapons or reactors? Yeah, yeah. So we we were the uh, so a missile tech. What we do is when we're underway, we do the kind of mid level maintenance on on the submarine or I'm sorry on the missiles themselves. Uh, we install uh, um, like the electronics assemblies, which actually arm the missiles. We do the that's basically our our whole job out to sea. But then when we come into um, come into port, you know, to kind of get refit and all that stuff, uh, security becomes really the high priority because that's when you're most likely to have someone try to attack the submarine, take it over, uh, you know, some kind of a terrorist act, you know, pick any one of like a million scenarios that could possibly happen. Yeah. So ooh, running security, like the Ohio class is big, but I can't, I yeah. can't, I can't imagine the, uh, the quarters were too comfortable on that. No. Thing. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it's definitely bigger than, you know, like a sea wolf class or something like that. And I'm very, very fortunate, very happy about that. Um, but yeah, you're, you're still tight quarters. It's, it's definitely tight quarters. Uh, and it's, uh, yeah, you, you try real, real hard to get along well with everybody. Cause if not, it's, it makes life really, really shitty. <laughs> <You know? laughs> And of course, you're hot bunking on subs. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I luckily never had to do that. I lucked out with that, but that hot racking, ugh, no way, man, no way. Uh -uh. See, this, I, this, this is why yeah. I like being in chats with Anamarki because he knows how to talk to U.S. U.S. veterans and everything from like the modern era. I'm too used to talking to like World War II veterans and everything. <laughs> We're like, well, I saw a bush over there and I shot at it because I thought there might be something in it, and then a boot <laughs> flew out, and I thought, well, that's one dead. <laughs> <laughs> that's so accurate that's exactly how those old world war ii that guys talk to it's just so matter of fact it's not even a story to them it's like yeah pop two nazis just right there those jerry's just fell over no big deal it's like all right fair enough i yeah, mean like okay. all right sorry i asked <laughs> <laughs> It's wild. My my yeah. my Aussie veteran my Aussie veteran friends complain about the Vietnam era guys. It's like back in my day, we didn't need no ACOGs. We had iron sides, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. That's yeah. what the carry handles for. You look down <laughs> that and shoot him. That's what the carry handles for? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what the sights mounted. That's actually yeah, a good no, question. No, just, Were you rocking uh, the A2s or did you get M4s by that stage? <laughs> uh, yeah, no. We had uh, we had M4s is what we ran with. Yeah, it's fucking life of luxury with you, Jesus. Yeah, right. Yeah, high speed. Your own bunk and on a high class, <laughs> yeah. an M4. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, because what is it? Um, yeah, because you guys still have. Uh, oh, well, what is your guys' standards in uh, the UK? Oh, well, the, uh, the LA 96. <laughs> I think they're replacing that. I can't remember what. Was. Yeah. Well, Australia uses the same one too, isn't it? The that uh, bolt no, design. Oh, good lord, no! We won't use that garbage, L eighty six. No, we can't sell Wait. it to anyone. Come on, we <laughs> by German. No, well, Austrian actually. So more cultured Germans, as they say. But yeah, yeah. we buy the we buy the Steyr. We uh, yeah, the Steyr. Okay. Yeah, I love that thing. It's yeah. so comfy to shoot, and you get uh, yeah. It's been years, but I still remember it. Well, but um, and, and what I remember is like you don't. It, it's such a shorter weapon, and you only lose maybe fifty meters. You know, compared to the M4, as far as reaching out and touching somebody. Yeah, because you still like, get man. a sixteen-inch barrel. You still get yeah. a sixteen-inch barrel on the uh, on the rifle, and it's still a uh, similar length. Oh, yeah. So they're and... talking about guns now. <laughs> They'll be <laughs> here for hours. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm not that much of an expert. I just. Uh, <laughs> 
my best friends are all infantrymen. So yeah. <laughs> you, you hang around long enough. <laughs> so you, you you chose to be around it, huh? Uh, well, I figured that if I was going to be a military historian, I better talk to the military people. Turns yeah, that makes out, sense. turns out the military people like it's a mindset. Even like you have to sort of transport yourself to a different world. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're you're dealing with weird people, just a totally different breed of humans. It's oh, an absolute I guess, fact. I guess that leads into. Uh, that leads into uh, the next question there, Pig, if you want to go ahead on that oh, one. Oh, we're 25 Ooh. minutes in. We're on to the second question. We're doing well. We're <laughs> doing well. Oh, it's oh, so great. This is this is normally how our stuff goes, by the way. It's an unorganized, chaotic mess. I have no <laughs> idea how any of us are popular. Seriously. <laughs> people, people talk we to are. me all the time we and say, you're we funny. Are. We like to watch your videos. Like, why? <laughs> why? <laughs> <laughs> right, okay. Okay. So yeah. you're... You asked to be an infantryman. You've been on a submarine. You were part of the Navy. What made you want to volunteer in Ukraine? Um, yes, yeah, so there's, there's a couple parts to that. Um, one, there are some people uh, that I I was friends with since uh, Syria. Yeah, you know, like the YPG and things. And you know, we stayed yeah. in touch kind of through Instagram, and that's you know the social medias and all that. Um, and when I, after I left, they went over, uh, to fight in the Donbass wars. Um, so anyways, I, you know, I stayed in touch with them. And then, um, when the war first started popping off, it was, uh, you know, I was sending them money to support them and helping them buy vehicles. Cause I kind of understood how dire the situation was. And I think the whole world did there for the first few days. Cause everyone thought it was going to be over in a week. Mm-hmm. Um, and then kind of things started to settle down a little bit and uh, we were having conversations and they said, hey, man, we actually we really need help uh, training these guys. Can you come over and help me train them? I was like, yeah, I can go do that. And, you know, at the time, like I said, I was like, I'll give you like three or four months and then I got to get back because you know, I have my own business here and I need to keep it going. Um, and then 18 months later, here I am still <laughs> in Ukraine. Um, that's one part of it. And then the other big part was uh kind of Zelensky and his really dog determination there at the beginning of the, of the war. I think, I don't know if you remember, uh, he it was Boris Johnson, I believe that offered them a flight out, you know, and he was like, no, nah, I don't, I don't want to flight, man. Just give me bullets. I was like, that's a pretty, that's a pretty badass thing to say for lack of a better word. It reminds me a little bit of, uh, you know, like the Winston Churchill speech, like we'll fight on the seas and oceans. Like we're never going to surrender, you know, really kind of, kind of got you bumping your chest it was like all right man like let's go to war let's go to war you guys got fight in you so it was a mixture of those two things that really uh kind of made me decide to go and then i ended up staying because i really missed uh that military kind of work and i was enjoying the people i was working with and kind of fell in love with the culture in the city um so decided to stay a little bit longer so as how how are you i'll start that question again so how were you treated like as a foreigner like were do you feel like you were like kept like away from the front lines away from the action everything as like a propaganda piece because you know you being discovered or killed or anything would be a huge blow to morale or were you like right there in the thick of everything no so i all right i have not been treated in a negative way in terms of being uh treated like a foreigner you know it's that i you know there's there's no stigma behind that when i'm saying it it's um i've been treated very well and i've been very much accommodated for a foreigner because i don't speak the language and they always try to make sure that there's a couple guys that are with me that have some english and can help me out and um so the being a foreigner thing the accommodation by the ukrainian people has been just phenomenal not just from the military just every person is just always there to try to help it's super awesome um but about the front line thing is, uh, yeah, they do tend to keep some Americans off the front lines, but I don't think it's because of the propaganda. I think more there's it's just a logistical nightmare. If you have, you know, three Americans that don't speak Ukrainian and three Ukrainians that don't speak American or English, sorry, um, how, how can you be a cohesive fighting unit, right? So unless you have enough eight or ten guys to form your own little squad, or you have enough Ukrainian or Russian to be able to conversate, they you know, they can't do that much with you on the front line as far as being involved in offensive operations. You see. What what did you actually you know? what did you actually do when you were over there? I mean, you you mentioned you were uh, largely involved in training troops, but what else did you do? 
Yep. So I was uh, involved in training troops. Um, I, I did a couple missions, nothing major. I've uh, been solely down in the uh, southern part of Ukraine. So started out, got down to Odessa. The line was just outside of Mykolaiv. Um, I was going up there running some missions with the 126th Brigade, which is a TDF unit that I originally joined when I got to Ukraine. Uh, like I said, then I went into doing mostly training. Um, and then once it kind of became pretty obvious that the Russians were withdrawing from her son, her son, we started moving up and doing, uh, helping with, you know, just like clearing out, uh, trenches and looking for minefields, stuff like that. Just real basic, easy stuff because we knew we didn't have to really engage the Russians that much because they were already fleeing. It was more about making the moves and doing everything safely and losing as few lives as possible um, for unneeded reasons, just because we wanted to rush or something. So I was involved with uh, the whole liberation of Kherson. Um, then after that, um, yeah, we moved out. I was, and I was in Kherson Oblast up north um, for four or five months. Then after that, I moved over to a reconnaissance unit that ran out of uh, Hurson City directly and was with them for quite a while. And now I'm here. Typical. That is a, that's a lot of terrain. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah, it's... Typical that the American would refer to trench clearing and mine sweeping as easy. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, it was well, a lot easier when there's not Russians there to shoot at you. Okay, fair <laughs> you know? enough. Yeah, I, I, you know, I mean, it, yeah, it's yeah. These are trenches that had already been abandoned, and we're looking more for the the IEDs, the booby traps, um, trying to see what intel left behind, uh, marking UXOs, that kind of stuff. You know, stuff that so that way we can start bringing more people forward and not worry about guys just randomly getting blown up because they you no know, no one checked to see if there was a bomb behind that door or an IED behind that door. Jesus. Okay. Uh, okay. I need. I need to ask a serious question here. Um, yeah. So take take your time answering this. How did you fit your balls onto the plane? <laughs> because I know they charge you extra for like heavy baggage and stuff. Yeah. It's uh. They're they're. Well, you got to pay a gross weight. So I definitely had to get the extra seat. That, <laughs> that was unfortunate. <laughs> That was unfortunate. So it was quite an expensive flight, but no. I wanted to. I wanted to put an addendum onto that. You mentioned the YPG. That's not <laughs> usually mentioned by someone, mm -hmm. unless th that's very. That's very much a if you know, you know sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so when I was in Iraq, uh, we actually worked with the Kurds quite a bit. Um, so I have a lot of respect for them. I have my own opinions on what's going on, but again, that's not really my people, and I kind of stay out of it. Um, but anyways, yeah, same thing. I, I supported them um, during their whole time. I still do support them this day, but I think it's pretty obvious. I don't think Syria will ever really get sorted out anytime in the near future because there's still 37 freaking different countries and factions and paramilitaries, you know, still fighting for power over there. And Russians. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Russians, I, I, Americans are still there. But then somehow there's the Turkeys are, is, are there, and then Israelis involved, but they're not, and no one really lines up with who they're supposed to line up with. The whole thing is just a absolute mess, you know, just a dumpster fire. Yeah, uh, I, just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to check that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm very familiar with a lot of people uh, affiliated with the YPG. Okay. Um. Uh. Yeah, that's all I'm going to say on that. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. Just um, yeah. Leave, leave it with that with those guys because it's. Uh, whole, uh, yeah. You um, know. Uh, more about more about the Australian government, actually. <laughs> uh, bandages, yes, bandages, yes. I I, bandages. I, I, I contributed funds for bandages. Let's. Just, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> Are they about five, five, six millimeter in length? Uh, yeah. The, uh, funnily enough, they are very, very adaptive uh, bandages. <laughs> <laughs> they're a cure for insomnia yeah, yeah. Uh, more, more of a i think i think they are more attuned to 792 bandages uh yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah, okay. seven six yeah. seven six by 51 yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but yeah so, anyway anyways yeah anyways <laughs> Oh God, I'm gonna get a call. Um, yeah, right. uh, yeah you know, that's fine. We'll deal with that when the when the time comes. Okay, I gotta ask. Uh, did you bring yeah. your own equipment? I brought all my own equipment, with the exception of my firearm, because um, that is the only thing I was not allowed to bring with me. Okay. Uh, but yeah, as far as you know, I brought my own helmet, um, 
night vision, hearing pro, body armor, uh, yeah, top to bottom, all my own uniform stuff. Uh, I, I brought all that with me. Now, when I joined the Ukrainian military officially, I was given a uniform and that stuff. But, you know, it took me, you know, it's a, at the time it was a two or three month process to actually get paperwork and join the military there. So I would have been living without a uniform for, say, 90 days. So if you're planning on going over there, definitely bring your own stuff, but not your own firearms. You can't bring any rounds, nothing like that. Not sure the uh, TSA would be so keen on though. It's gonna be no. gonna be real gonna be real on that. Yeah, and and border control. Come to think of it, <laughs> well, you know, you you say that, but uh, I actually had a friend who was living in Switzerland a couple years ago, and somehow he got into Switzerland with a handgun through <laughs> like five different security companies, which is just shocking. And I was like, "What am I supposed to do with this?" I was like. I- I would throw it in a river, find the deepest oh, lake, and throw it in it. <laughs> <laughs> if that was me, that's what I would do. Medical supplies. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. exactly what I said. No, yeah. I, I, actually, so question uh, yeah. for the for the gear nerds in the audience. So mm-hmm. when you say you brought your own gear, like you said you brought your own ear pro, are we talking like basic ear pro? Are we talking Peltors like the, the Yeah, cool so uh, yeah, I use I use Walters, but yeah, the Pelotors, um, and what's funny is you're, you're at, I'm uh, maybe because I'm old, but I'm super low tech. I never, never use them. They're always on my helmet. I never use them. I always just put in the little bitty squishy things in my ears. Don't know why, but um, yeah, <laughs> but using I'll those. That, uh, uh, yeah, uh, G-Watt, my G-Watt Boomer cred. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exact. Yeah, G Watt Trap Lord, man. G Watt Trap Lord. I'm, uh, I'm just imagining all the, the the former U.S. Marines in my comments going, "Jesus Christ, this fancy pants Navy boy with his fancy <laughs> equipment." Back in my day, we didn't have no bullshit. You had your steel helmet, you had your iron sights, and you were happy with it. You brought your own nods too. That's that's yeah. that's kind yeah. of impressive. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Well, so the, that's the thing is you got to be real careful because there's only certain ones you can bring, and if not, you're breaking like all kinds of ITAR laws and like Interpol things. So <laughs> be careful with that one. Be careful with that one. Uh, but yeah, same thing. Um, brought my own my own rig. Brought my own plates. Um, because I have you know, I have the kind of high speed, real lightweight ceramic ones. Um, so it's all my uniform, battle belts, uh, all my own pouches, helmets, um, and then all my other ancillary stuff. You know, like my survival stuff as far as uh, water filtration kits, IFAX, uh, MREs, emergency rations. Like that, that's actually a good point. Best yeah. MRA, best MRA. Everyone's answer is different. Best MRA. Go. Uh, are you going like by what country? Uh, no, just buy buy from the U.S. menu because ooh, mm. banana pudding. The, ra- the ravioli one is usually my one of my favorites because it's just an easy go to. Yeah, and then there was a uh, what was no it wasn't beef stroganoff. What was it? That wouldn't happen to be menu item sixteen, uh, Southwest beef by any chance, would it? I think that is exactly what it is. Yeah, yeah. my boy. Yeah, my like boy. Yeah. My boy. He knows. He knows. Yeah. That's the that's the good shit right there. That's the good shit right there. It's uh yeah, I don't remember the numbers, man. I never uh yeah, then it's how jalapeno, jalapeno cheddar, as we say. Oh it. dude. The jalapeno cheddar. <laughs> jalapeno business. cheese spread is the shit. It is. It's the absolute best, man. It's absolutely uh, awesome. Yeah, it's it's just horrible for you. It's absolutely oh, yeah. horrible. But, you don't shit for a week, but <laughs> no, no, you don't. Yeah, so uh, I don't know much about the American MREs. I only know that yeah. the British ones. I only know that it comes with a little bottle of Tabasco sauce. And if you want <laughs> yeah. to, if you want to speak to any veteran of the British Army, you bring with you a giant tub of Tabasco sauce, and you put it on the table, and you say, "You can have that," and they'll tell you anything you want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something that still just amazes me about the British military is the fact that you guys have tea makers in your freaking tanks. Yes. Like, it is amazing. Boiling vessel, standard issue, yeah. Mark II, I think they're on now, because the original one was in the back of the old uh, well, the Centurion, I think it was. They, they, they've gotten better. Yeah, the days. Centurions had them, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Because, because half the MREs were boiled in the back. Just throw them in the <coughs> yeah. vessel. And you, yeah. you got yourself a nice cooked meal. Plus, when you're out on when you're out on campaign, you're in Iraq and Afghanistan. They, they don't. The, the foreigners just cannot do good tea. So you need to bring your own. 
Yeah, right. We have it's, it's not our thing. It's dirt water, you know. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen Ted Lasso, but there's a scene where he drinks coffee, and that's about every American oh, dude. reaction. To yeah, British Ted Lasso dirt. was amazing. Yeah, nope, I taste just like I thought it would, just like dirt. Yep, that's dirt, right. Dirt, dirt and water. Yeah, dirt and water. Yep. yeah. yeah that's about right. I'm so, absolutely. Amazing. Anyways, yeah. So, um, you didn't obviously you couldn't bring your own firearm. Uh, what kind of firearms did you? I'm. I'm I'm toying a line here because we're about to start discussing guns again. But what yeah. guns did you, what kind of firearms did you use? Were you um, yeah, so there was just a, I have a basic standard issue AK-74, you know, stamped rifle. From what five, era? Um, <laughs> it was, oh, it's Soviet era. I think it was, it was 1981 or 1982 was the stamp on it. Okay, so not that bad, so, actually. Yeah, it's, uh, it was newer. It was newer than most. Newer than most. Um, but then, like, the the team that was with Mick alive, we had, we got, I mean, we got everything we wanted. We had, you know, PKM, RPK, uh, AKSs. We had mounds to go set, you know, the Soviet version of the Claymores. Um, we had some RPGs. We had, uh, AT fours because I actually knew how to use an AT four. Um, and I'm trying to think that's pretty much, yeah, that's pretty much what we had. And then we had, like, two of us had Makarovs. We had Pistolas. Uh, you know, then just offensive, defensive grenades. And that's about it. You're pretty well equipped, then. Yeah, yeah, we were we were very well equipped. Our our apartment, it looked like we were some kind of terrorist cell just waiting. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was ridiculous. <laughs> Green boxes everywhere. And it, the whole house had clowns in it. It was so weird. <laughs> so weird. <laughs> it, like, again, a fever dream. The whole thing was just a fever dream. Like I, the, you know, I, I, that's weird. I, yeah, I, yeah. I gotta ask: Did you feel yeah. there was like any? Because you've obviously been on both sides. Do you honestly feel there was any significant difference between like Western and Soviet firearms? There's a massive difference. Um, but with that being said, they're still very competitive with one another. If that makes sense. Like for example, the M4 is by far the better rifle in terms of accuracy, in terms of distance, you know, precision shooting. Mm -hmm. um, but that AK, I can, it'll take me about a week to teach someone how to properly use an M4, right? And there's a billion pieces to the thing and it takes a 30 minute, you know, to pick it apart and put it back together and all that. Whereas an AK-47, AK platform, give me about four hours and I can have you accurately shooting. Now, you're not going to be out to five, 600 meters. You're going to be at 300 but the average engagement is 300 meters anyway. So what am I really losing? Um, you know, the thing can be buried in, in sand for 10 years and you can pick it up, put it rounds in it and it'll shoot, you know, 90% of the time. Um, you know, but then it is, it's also heavier. So then there's like troop fatigue. So they, it's just like for every trade-off, it, it's literally, they're absolute opposites, but still absolutely competitive. So it's a very wild thing in my opinion. The lack of a rail system must be a pain in the dick too. Yeah, yeah. That you have to to make it, to make an old AK like that um, usable in any way outside of these old iron sights. Yeah, there's some, some, quite a few upgrades you have to do to it. You know, really pulling the buttstock off, so you can at least get something retractable. Um, usually, the grips on those things are garbage, so you want to get the nice mylar's. Um, like I said, getting a rail on it, and the problem with that is you actually get it to have to get it to a blacksmith to like kind of welded on because the ones that go around the side, they'll never hold a true zero if you're putting any no. type of optic on it. So, you know, and then also when you do that, then your side above bore becomes too high. So now you're less accurate with a weapon that's already not that accurate to begin with. So. Which makes the whole addition of your optic useless in the first place. Yeah. Lesson. Right. Yeah. It's like, so what did you just waste $1,500 on an Elkin for? So. And I guess the, also the the AK has that pro, like the benefits of that AK are the loose tolerances, but at the same time, like those loose tolerances are a pain when fitting optics and stuff because you you, you, yeah. you lose to zero. You're yeah. running around taking cover, doing all that dumb shit, and you just right. your rifle is useless after an hour. So. Yeah, it's it's like they they very much committed to this attack in large wave, and it's very much in a, an assault rifle in the truest sense. You know, whereas the M4 you can use it as an assault rifle, but then also kind of as a defensive weapon, you can kind of get, you know, you can get out and touch somebody just enough with them. If you're a really good shot with right optics and, you know, the right munition in it. And with AK, you just, you can't, you don't really have that option. It's a, you run straight and you shoot, <laughs> you know? 
There you go. There you go. Uh, my, my old axiom is proven correct yet again. For those in chat, say it with me. If you want someone dead, buy American. <laughs> yeah. Always. Every time. <laughs> Hands down. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. Well, it's true, though. Uh, it's, 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 so, it's, it's accurate. That's why it's terrible. It's because it's absolutely <laughs> accurate. You give me a choice between between the god awful crap that the Russians are sending over and something built by Lockheed Martin or Raytheon. I know what I'm buying. <laughs> yeah. I don't care if I have to sell my kidney, but like you right. know, at least I'll still be able to use the other kidney afterwards because yeah. I'll still be alive. <laughs> right, right. I mean, yeah. There, there's a reason why in Abrams there's a twenty million dollar tank and a T seventy two is about one and a half. You know, there's a reason for that. Three hundred thousand. Yeah. Do what? Oh, no, I meant like brand new when they were brand new. <laughs> Oh, for brand new, yeah, you're about, about yeah. a million and a half. These days, you can get a, a T72M for about 300 grand. Yeah, isn't that wild? <laughs> uh, you couldn't convince... I, I mean, I, I wouldn't fit in it, but uh, you couldn't convince me to get in it, even if I could. Uh, I don't know, man. If I, I, don't, I got a couple buddies with money. I think I could hit them up for one. Tell me it wouldn't be fun to just drive a tank to the bar. Just, um, I, the thing I, is... What are, what are they going to do, like tow you? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, me and my mates worked this out. We were looking on a, what, Armored Vehicle Finder. I think it's actually a UK website. Uh, mm. The the BTR is actually road legal. And like, yes, given is. things oh. going on, going given things going on in Ukraine right now, I mean, you yeah. could probably pick one up. You could get one Send for a deal. Yeah. Who is yeah, it? you're right. Who's going to tow that, it? <laughs> uh, what's that power lifter guy? That, doesn't he drive one of those all, the, all over the UK? Um, Eddie Hall, isn't that his name? Oh no, he drives a uh what is is it a scorpion? I think it's a scorpion. It's, it might be a oh, scorpion, the, yeah. The little light it tank? is, yeah. 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 <laughs> Love that guy. Oh dude, he's powerlifting champion. He's a Chad. <laughs> yeah. Absolute legend. Yeah. So it, yeah. Anyways, yeah, we're good at rabbit holes, man. This this conversation is good for rabbit holes. Oh, trust me. You should uh <laughs> you should you should reprise an appearance on the official NAFO even round a table podcast, which in of itself is an inside joke. Um <laughs> it's it's not that but, it, it's it's not that much of a joke. It's it's literally um there's a there's an old Vatnik who used to do a, a sort of round table podcast with other Vatniks and they would just sit and talk shit about how great they were for about an hour and they called it the rounder table podcast. So we called ours the even rounder table podcast. <laughs> <laughs> he's been arrested he's in prison now so fuck him. yeah he's the SBU got him yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which which was satisfying as hell I'm not gonna lie well they got him twice because they released him they released him on bail and told him like don't leave the country so his great plan was to seek asylum I think in in Hungary or something and rather than go to the embassy he live streamed himself running yeah. to the border <laughs> <laughs> and it was just picked up by the border guards. It's like, what are you doing? Right. Massive brain. <laughs> so I've actually got one of the questions here I wanted to ask yeah. you. Yeah. What was your first what were your first days like when you rocked up to Ukraine? Like what were your first days like? Because uh, that would have yeah, been heck. So um all right, so I I wanna clarify this question. Was it like literally the first few days I got to Ukraine because I was actually stuck in Lviv for the first few days or like the first time I actually got to like Odessa and, and into my unit and stuff like that. Well, we'll go with the spicy answer. What was it like when you first got to your unit and started doing things? Okay. Um, man, that is a good question. Um, it was Without getting not, yourself thrown in prison. <laughs> all right. So it was not at all what I was ready for. Um, I was expecting everything to be completely Soviet, you know, Eastern Bloc, concrete houses, nobody smiles, everyone hates Americans, you know what I mean? Like, just that very iconic ex-Soviet Bloc country. Um, and then I got there and I was like, wow, most people have a, a decent understanding of, of English or enough where you can communicate with them, you know, um, everyone's super nice. Uh, there's actually beautiful buildings. You know, like Odessa is a beautiful city. If you ever get a chance to go, I would highly recommend it. Um, uh, preferably after the war's over, you know? Um, but yeah, and, and like, I came in just expecting like, we're going to be eating, you know, rice and MREs and, uh, infrastructure is going to be down. You know what I mean? Like no cars are on the road. Everyone's living in their basements under candlelight. It was like, no, people just kind of said, 
to hell with the Russians, dude. We're just, we're going to keep living our lives. You're not going to uh, make us live in fear every day. You're know, like, I'm still going to take my kids to school and, and I'm still going to go to my job and I'm still going to go out to eat. I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to do those things just to defy what the Russians were trying to do to the Ukrainian people, you know, which was scary. I mean, it's, it's still what they do to this day with those missile attacks. So yeah, it really showed me the resilience of Ukrainian people. And that was really my, yeah, the big, like I said, it was just completely opposite of what I thought I was going to be going into. That leads into the next question. Where's the yeah. best place to eat in Odessa? Oh, man. Um, Odessa's got some great food, dude. Um, what depends what you're eating. All right. So there is a there's a huge actually uh, Vietnamese population uh, in Odessa. Because I guess during the Vietnam War, a lot of the refugees were sent to the Odessa region from Vietnam that would have been on the Soviet side. So like good pho, um, all that kind of stuff. If you're into that. Um, definitely come here there's four literally any vietnamese restaurant you go to is good um if you want the old pub like mick o'neill's is probably the oldest it's the oldest pub um or irish pub british pub i don't think they really know which one they are they're trying to <laughs> somewhere between you know uh but it's the oldest they got really good beer there um and they're one of the few places i can watch my formula one so i get real excited oh he's an that. f1 guy legend yeah love f1 yeah, um, that's why he's back in america yeah, yeah, that's that is why I'm in America. I was there. For oh, the you went to Vegas? One. Yeah, I was at the Vegas. Yeah. Oh, dude, what a race though! Yeah, it was so, it was so good. It's, it was so good. Um, and it's only going to get better because only, uh, you know, they obviously had some problems with it, but those will be resolved, you know, for next time. <laughs> oh, uh, that poor old, uh, poor old mate hitting the the manhole cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh, dude, that yeah. was bad. Um, oh, the FAA would have had a fit. Right. Um. So uh, Esther, there's a, a restaurant called Esther there in Odessa, and it's absolutely amazing. Um, if you want kind of the higher end feel, uh, a good buddy of mine owns a place called Non Solo Pizza. It's kind of in the suburbs, uh, and I think he has the best pizza in Odessa. Um, best burger, it was a hard one. Their, their burgers here are freaking amazing, or in, in Ukraine. They're absolutely amazing. Um, I'd say, probably say like maybe Corbin's. If I had, if I was just gonna get burgers, probably Corvins. Um, I don't know. I'm just trying to think. Um, if, you, if you're into King Kali, Georgian food, Shashlik, any type of barbecue, there's so many options here in Odessa as well. Like, there's just really so. Uh, yeah, it's very hard to name the best restaurant. It's more of what exactly are you looking for, you know? Yeah, man. But what it does get across is just that the the local businesses and local communities of Ukraine mm. are just they're still there and they're still going. Yeah. Like, yeah. They, uh, you know, and it was one of those, you know, when I first got here, there was very few businesses were open, but they were still operating. But I'd say by July of last year, probably 70, 60, 70 percent of the businesses were open. And now um, over the summer, I mean, I don't think I saw a single building boarded up or closed up. You know, every lot was every space, you know, was was let out and had some kind of business going on in it, at least, you know, down in the downtown, you know, central business district kind of area. So, uh, yeah, that really goes to show um, the difference, you know, a year makes. Yeah, I must admit, with all these soldiers around, especially with the uh, with the Southern Front, the way it is right now, mm. those pizza places would be doing a roar and trade at the moment, I would imagine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if my if my knowledge, if my friends is any good for that, I, the pizza places, I all I, I do know. That that um after everything calmed down, that Mac is or excuse me McDonald's in Kiev uh didn't see actually a boost in profits for a while. Then. Really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> There's a great cliff of uh, a a good a good friend of the NAFO crowd, um Richard Woodruff. He runs Frontline Kitchen up in uh, yeah. I'm familiar with him. You, yeah. you bet, Rich. Yeah, there's this great video of him sitting eating eating McDonald's in a Kiev food court, oh. and there's an air raid siren. Going, there's a <laughs> missile attack. Mm -hmm. He's just like, and you can see my. I used to work at McDonald's. It gave me a strange sense of pride. You just <laughs> see the the Mac's workers behind the counter. They're like, they look up. Oh, it's an air raid. It's like Big Mac for two. Yeah, what, like, yeah. You <laughs> you're, yeah, you're not. Yeah, you're not. <laughs> You're not going to stop me from getting my McDouble, man. It's not happening. That's just life just in the happening. services industry. You don't stop for nothing. <laughs> no. 
You're well, up to you're up to your you're up to your fucking ankles and sewage. You know, there's a fire going on behind you. You're still cooking burgers. You you don't. That's care. exactly right. You, you go down with the ship. Yeah. You go down with the ship and it's McDonald's. Oh, no, you know, seriously. That's, you got to remember that's the McDonald's. That's our U.S. embassy. That's what that you know. It's not the actual embassy. It's McDonald's. That's hollowed American ground right there. Yeah, we I, you keep that fucking thing. You keep that thing running all capitalism cylinders on. Oh yeah, Just dude. You have no idea how true that is. You know how in America you guys have the Waffle House index. Like, <laughs> if a Waffle House is open, uh, that's how you judge the disaster level, right? Yeah. In a, in Australia, it's the Macca's index because Australia, <laughs> we like our country burns down in summer every year, right? Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had a we had just before summer hit, we had this massive storm, like maybe 2017, I think it was. Uh 2016, actually, maybe. Yeah, 2016. We had this massive storm in my state of Australia. Blackout, like completely, as in the transmission towers from our power stations were blown down by the strength of this storm. Right. Wow. So even the backup generators failed. Like the whole state went black, just gone. Yeah. Not even street lights, nothing. And my ass still showed up to work and I'm like, we've got a backup generator, right? And they're like, all right, you can go home. And then the moment I get back, the backup generators kicked in. Not the full, not the full power. State state power was still out, but the backup generators in the poor area went on. And I get a yeah. phone call from my manager. Hey, can you come back? <laughs> no, no, you sent me home. No, 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 no. Oh no, um, I, I went back like a good, like a good Mac is trooper, and sure enough, <laughs> and sure enough, because everyone's power and all of that has been out, no one's been able to cook anything, and so there is a queue. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, yep. That's so. That's you can always tell when there's an area because McDonald's now they they force them to shut down because when they opened the one in Odessa, yeah, people just did not care. They were like, no, I'm <laughs> I am sitting here, I'm eating my McFlurry. And I don't care if I blow up. Do not care. <laughs> you know? So now they force them. But, uh, and it's just happened a few months ago. So the queue's already just so, so much longer than it usually is anyways, you know, because so many people have been wanting McDonald's for the last year and a half. Uh, um, but yeah. Uh, you, but yeah, then, and then the queue gets so long because, like I said, they have to shut all the fryers and everything down and blah, blah, blah. But anyways, yeah. So we've, I've seen exactly what you're talking about over here in Odessa. It's, uh, yeah, and it's absolutely wild to see. And it's like, I would never wait 30 minutes to get McDonald's. Nothing against McDonald's, but good Lord, <laughs> you know. Well, right. they're going to have to put the Hassan one back up, although they probably already have knowing yeah. Macca's. Probably. No, they, um, they said they're up in Odessa. They're in Lviv, Kiev. Um, I believe Kharkiv has them open. Um then they're going to be opening the one in Mykolaiv, which is about an hour west of Kherson. But you're asking, talking about pizza places. There are three restaurants open in Kherson when I was up there two months ago, and they were all pizza places. Pizza and sushi is what it's, it's called. Alexander Son's Pizza and Sushi. There's three of them. See, this this, be, this, this this is the thing, you know, as 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 this war goes on, as Ukrainian troops manage to retake Maripol, they're going to be flooding in, and behind them is just going to be the truck building the McDonald's behind them. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Ronald McDonald wants his money back. Like, he's very upset with the Russians. You know? <laughs> Like, I could I could do an entire video on the like post World War II like American corporate liquidator squads that followed <laughs> the Allied <laughs> God, yes. No, I, I mentioned it in one of my most recent videos talking about Ukraine and how <laughs> certain political parties are less than supportive, which we won't go into for fear of starting fights in the comment section. Um, but there was this big moment I mentioned it where. It, like the capitalism boner for like American businesses was so strong that uh, during the war, the eighth air force would bomb a German factory making tanks or trucks or whatever. But it was actually a subsidiary of Ford or GM that had been seized by the Nazis. And so the government had to pay GM and Ford damages for the factory that they blew up. <laughs> <laughs> That's ridiculous. That's true. <laughs> that is true. I think it honestly just shows the resilience of the Ukrainians that like they're under <laughs> missile attack like almost every single day. But like all the shops now, the grocery stores are open and people were just kind of wandering around. There was a brilliant story, I think, um, during the the uh, Kherson offensive, and they retook, or was it Kharkiv? I can't remember. I think they, they retook Kherson, and the first people into the newly liberated Kherson was not like uh, was not like the troops or anything. It was the postal delivery service. <laughs> I could believe that. I, w I would 100% believe that. 
Um, Nova Post, like th- those dudes, I- I've never seen a more efficient government ran system in my entire life. It is wild. Um, you can get something from one side of the country to the other in 24 hours. I mean, that's just a normal thing. And those oh, dudes deliver to some of the most rich, just blown up, destroyed freaking villages. And they're, it's just wild. You'll be going to watch, you know, on the other side of the river. And there's a little Nova Post truck going to drop off the package. Jesus Christ. <laughs> hope you got that done in this on, country. Man. Like, yeah. oh, royal royal mail on getting to you for another three weeks but no, yeah, no. oh, yeah. fucking, no, fucking my mailman he's turning around yeah they won't go to <laughs> they won't go to the south side of chicago there's no way they're gonna go to a fuck line there's no way <laughs> fucking royal mail send one of those fucking idiots with a parcel force van out to put a, a little note through your door we attempted a delivery but you were not i was in i'm watching you on the fucking front door camera <laughs> i can see See your lazy ass out there! This is running around going, Pasha Forest, yeah! Fuck you! <laughs> the UPS I have of opinions. Doom. I have opinions. <laughs> oh, don't get me star. Oh, Star Trek's not too bad, but standard Aussie post is pretty t- It's just the idea, though. Like, you're there on stag of what the British infantry will call it. You're out there holding your patrol post, <laughs> and, they, and you just see this truck. Like, you know, there's landmines, there's. There's yeah, like going. Lancet drones patrolling, and he's just <laughs> yeah. They, they, that Nova Potia guy, man, he's right in there. Tank, tank, BTR. Nova Potia, tank, tank, BTR. <laughs> he's, he's he's about it, man. He's he's a he's a hitter. He's they're ready to go, dude. <laughs> he's down to clown. Yeah, they are. They are tip of the spear. It's wild. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> oh, never, so yeah. Maybe that's what that maybe that's that's the that's the spearhead for the next counteroffensive. That's what's retaking <laughs> that's Crimea. It. Nova Post truck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Little hensus just do, 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 do. <laughs> the amphibious operation yeah. is like you know speedboats <laughs> with the logo yeah. on the side. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, God, there's yeah. like same day delivery over landmines, and that's wild. yeah. I mean, they yeah, like I ship something from Odessa up to Hassan pretty regularly, and it's I said it's there. If I ship it at noon, it's there by noon the next day, and it's a there's only one Nova poster that's really working there in Hassan, like a big major hub you can send big stuff to, um, and it gets bombed pretty regularly, and they just they just keep going. They don't care. They're just it's. It blows my mind that they continue to work. As many times, like, well, we'll just rebuild the building. We'll just keep going. It's like, <laughs> like, all right, cool. That's it's nuts. nuts. What yeah. question are we on, Pig? Uh, incidentally, no how how long have we have we got you for? Because that's been about an hour now. Yeah, I, I I'd probably need to wrap it up for the next ten minutes or so. All right. Okay. In which case, we got we got uh we got one here. The 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 last one on the list you sent me, Pig. What about that one? All right. Okay. So, in your opinion, what mm-hmm. would, uh, in your opinion, what would be the best weapons or equipment that we could give to Ukraine? And to follow up, what in your, what in your opinion is the best way for your country, the United States, or like any other country in the West, to help support Ukraine? Yeah. Um, all right. So, when you're saying my country, uh, you're, I'm assuming we're talking about as a government, not as like an individual person working with humanitarian groups, right? Either are. Okay. Um, All right. So this is a multi-part question. Sorry, let's go back to the first one. Okay. So in your, in your opinion, what is the best weapons or equipment that we can, that we can give to help Ukraine? Are we talking like trucks, Um, gloves, earmuffs, tents, uh, to firearms, you know, whatever. Yeah. Um, Right now, plain and simple. So the humanitarian groups uh, and small collectives that raise money for troops have done a really good job about getting them the cold weather gear, the boots, the tents, that kind of stuff. Um, And again, coming. So I I think they're and these people are continuing to do that. Um, So I I think we're okay there as well as the funding. The Ukraine, Ukraine government has done a good job dispersing that money to make sure everyone's got their coats and their winter uniforms and all that stuff. Um, as far as weaponry, the, the, I mean, it's, this is a simple answer is you're not going to win a modern war without air superiority. So until we have, uh, an air fleet large enough to maintain air superiority over at least part of the airspace, uh, 
nothing, this will become, this will be a stagnant war for a very, very long time. Um, so that being said, you know, the F-16s, Euro fighters, things like that. Uh, you know, I don't think we're going to give away any of our F-22s or F-35s anytime soon. I wish. Uh, you know, I but you're right. Uh, but an F-16 is an absolutely capable fourth generation fighter that can take on anything that the Russian military has, you know, um, given which it has all the right upgrades on it to the body or the frame. So that's big. Uh, and then AT-10s or A-10s, like the Warthog, I, that's the best close air support thing. And it's literally made to bust tanks in the thousands and run trench lines. And the Marines or the Army or Air Force want to get rid of them anyway. So I don't know why we're not sending these by the droves over. Um, I have opinions on that. <laughs> I, I have yeah. But... <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that's, I, I'd be interested because I, I can't for the life of me figure it out. Makes no sense. If we want to get rid of them, why are we not going to garage sell them to someone for 10 cents on the dollar? Uh, it's 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 a it's a Congress thing. Uh, it's a lot of old people in yeah, Congress. Yeah, um, fair. Look at and you, I mean you you know yourself. You see an A ten open up on something. You feel yeah. it. You feel it tingle in your balls, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, I, you smell freedom. You smell freedom. You when smell that freedom. I mean, I I've railed about how genuinely shit the A ten actually is as a, as a performance. How badly designed it was. Um, the whole sort yeah. of politics behind it all. You know how how better it could be if it was freaking fixed. But yeah, you, you see it open up on something. You just mm. you you watch that you watch the, that fucking massive rotary cannon just like annihilate something in front of you. You are standing up. You're saluting. You've got a tear coming out your eye. That tear just turns into a bald eagle, flies away, and you're like, oh, praise <laughs> can you see? I mean, if we're being serious, I think I think the uh, I think there is a, a middle ground. Everyone can <coughs> all agree on here is that if I can say this: If we get Ukraine enough F-16 so they can win air superiority over a country, <coughs> if we can get the A-10s into the pe place where the air superiority was won, oh mm. boy, <laughs> yeah. oh boy, oh yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. Well, because oh. you know, because that's that's the last piece of the puzzle that's missing is once you can get even air superiority in a region, right? That now allows that interdiction campaign that we can use with the high Mars and these MLR systems to then slowly start pushing these guys back because that's what's going to allow the tanks to move forward, you know, knowing that they have the, the right kind of air cover and air support. So, you know, and then that's the other thing is it's not just getting the technology, it's getting enough of them. Um, and I have to remind Americans about that all the time. You know, we sent some Abrams tanks over, and I don't remember what it was. It wasn't very many, right? Like 20 or 30 of them, mm. right? Maybe a battalion's worth. And they're great equipment, but if you have 30 tanks going up against 12,000 T-72s, it doesn't matter how good the Abrams is, it's not going to beat 12,000 tanks, you know? This, this is a thing. I'm working on a video right now, which is all about, like, why is why is the counteroffensive around Zaporizhia and everything being so kind of lackluster? Like, Because mm -hmm. like, everyone was kind of expecting a repeat of the Kherson offensive, where just, like, the entire Russian front just collapsed overnight, and that's just mm -hmm. not been the case. And I've, it, it's, it's a huge part yeah. of that is, like, um, when these tanks arrived, like, the Ukrainians were kind of expecting, like, Western tanks to be, like, the kind of shock and all and the Russians to retreat and what actually happened was like the Russians were just equipped with like thousands upon thousands of um, anti-tank guided missiles like the mm -hmm. whole way along the front you got um, anti-tank ditches you got anti-tank mines um, yeah their things, de defense in depth is like 60 kilometers yeah it's ridiculous it, it, it is absolutely ridiculous that does take time to clear and the thing is even mm -hmm. if that all wasn't there it's, we don't live in a world where you can get a huge block of tanks and charge them across a field and expect that to be successful without huge amounts of support. Yeah, that's it. That's exactly right. You know, um, yeah, if you want to do what the Americans did in Iraq and just swoop through a country, you have to have massive air support. You know, there was a lot of F-16s and F-22s rolling around in 2003, not to mention, you know, your Cobra or Apaches and all Cobra strike helicopter or helicopters, Blackhawks, you know, massive logistical supply trains behind them. You know, it's just well, that was that was like a, that that air war was like a hunt was like about three months long, and it was the combined yeah. might of like three of the most powerful air forces in the world, like like France, yeah. the UK, and the United States. Just and it still took them three and a half months before like the yeah. ground invasion could begin. Like yeah, Ukraine over, doesn't have yeah. that option. You know? Yeah, I mean, and there you go. You know, and you've got Ukraine, which before the war was, I don't know, like the 47th best equipped military in the, in the world. 
mm-hmm. coming up against mm-hmm. the second. So that's right there. She kind of ex- tell you why it takes so long. You know, if it took three of the top militaries or air forces in the world to take on Iraq, like what do you think Ukraine's got to do against Russia? It's going to take a long time. You know, and war will never move at a politician's pace. You know, a lot of people don't think about that. That's the big one. Mm-hmm. That's the big one. We need to get as many aircraft into Ukraine as possible with the weapon systems to get things moving. Mm-hmm. It's the one time I actually support the use of the Gripen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bring it. Bring it. Because that, that's an ex- bring it. it's an extraordinary capable jet if in the right hands. Yeah. And it would it would do everything that Ukraine needs it. Yeah. Well, that's it, it's a very uh it's a niche fighter or aircraft rather, I think. But it it, it would fit this war mm-hmm. very well. Come yeah. on, Sweden. Do you think? Do you think yeah. Sweden? Come on. Come, right. on. <laughs> come on. Come on. Poke it with a stick. Do something. <laughs> Do something. <laughs> So that that answers that question. Yep. F F16s is what we need. Yeah. And what is the best way for the individual to help? Yeah, for the, the individual is, you know, it's uh, the Ukrainian government's been working on this and I think that there's a few other groups you can get on Google and find it um where they have compiled all the different humanitarian groups that are working um you know in Ukraine right now and take the time to go through there and understand what these groups do and figure out what it is you really want to support. You know, like, do you want to support saving dogs from the front line who they've lost their families or getting kids clothes or old ladies, you know, medical equipment or whatever it is, or getting troops, IFAX, all that. Find it do and do research on it and understand what it is they do and how they do it. Because there's a lot of people working here um, and don't, and they're with, with a lot of, with a lot of companies like that, there are, um, there's always one or two bad guys. So make sure you don't get scammed. Sorry, that's, I do want to put that out there. You know, take your time, do your research because there are always, always scammers out there. Um, but yeah, do, uh, anyways, yeah, do your research and definitely find the places that are supporting the cause that you want. So that way you, as the person sending the money gets the gratitude, the, you know, that self gratitude or self satisfaction that, that you deserve. If you're going to support, uh, you know, people in a time of need like this. Okay. Yeah. That's a good message. I mean, I personally want to give a shout out to, I want to give a shout out to Frontline Kitchen. My boy, Richard. I want to give a shout out to him. Frontline Kitchen are a good charity to donate to. They work very hard feeding the boys. Um, Mm -hmm. They also organize other stuff like, you know, equipment and so forth. So, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give up um, yeah, he's a good he's a good place he's to start. A, he's a good yeah. Bean, yeah. Yeah. Um yeah, I would say, yeah, there's uh probably the group that I've worked with the most. It's called Quartermaster for Ukraine, and it's a Swedish company. Uh and I think they've actually they work with NAFO a little bit as well. Um but anyways, he's they're they're great dudes. And he's you make a list, I'll fill it. He's he's one of those guys, extremely dedicated. Um, so yeah, if you're looking for a good start as far as equipment for, for the troops, that's, that's where I would start. Yeah. And, and the world kitchen thing, that's, if you're going more humanitarian side for the civilians, that's definitely a good place to start. Cause I have heard of your boy and have heard nothing but good things. All righty. Okay. I think so, we just, we just about hit it. So yep, with that, cool. uh, was there anything, any messages you have for the fans out there? <laughs> no, no, just, uh, you know. Keep people in your prayers, you know, keep supporting Ukraine, keep it in, keep it in everyone's mind, you know, because uh, we don't, it, it can't leave this, this social media and this, we, we can't let it leave the forefront and become a, a second thought because that'll lead to much worse things down the road, I think. And one quick, one quick last question. Do you have a message for anyone who still supports Russia through all this? What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Fair like, enough. So, I'll leave it at that. (laughs) So I was always taught to never speak ill of the dead, to only ever see good things about them. Gonzalo Lira is dead. Good. Okay, to be fair, the circumstances surrounding his death are largely shrouded in propaganda and misinformation, since a lack of clear communication from the Ukrainians has basically allowed the Vatnik press to interpret his death as whatever they want it to mean, from general neglect, to torture, to assassination, 
The reality was he was a 55-year-old man going on about 85. Even prior to his arrest, his health was not exactly great. He was suffering under the effects of both lung damage and long COVID from being a die-hard anti-vaxxer, as well as a sexually transmitted disease, which was rumoured, but not confirmed, to be AIDS. He also smoked over 100 cigarettes a day, notably the cheapest cigarettes he could buy, which probably didn't help, and all this combined with one of the coldest winters Ukraine has ever had on record, a fluctuating power grid under nightly attack from Russia, not enough generators and heaters to go around, as well as an apparent refusal to be treated in a hospital, Gonzalo Lira contracted pneumonia and passed away alone in the dark and the cold. And what should be a tragic set of circumstances is, if I can be completely honest, utterly fitting for a man who led such a hate-filled and spiteful life. But even though I was on a live stream while this was going on and I mockingly laughed as news of his death was confirmed by the US State Department, I do not relish or even particularly celebrate this man's death, even though I have every right to do so. I honestly just don't care. But given that I am being consistently misquoted on the subject, I will attempt to set the record straight. So for everyone emailing me and messaging me over various social media platforms, these are my thoughts. Firstly, everyone reporting on this is wrong. Lira was not a journalist. However low your opinion of that profession, to imbue him with that title would be an insult to the profession and to humanity as a whole. He was not a journalist. Nothing he ever really did amounted anything close to resembling even the vaguest description of what that would entail. Lira was at best a blogger, and at worst he was a lamp which lit up green with a little truth sign for whenever the Vatnik saw something which confirmed their beliefs, or lit up a little red false sign for whenever they saw something they didn't like. Lira was not a journalist, he was a mouthpiece. Not to Russian propaganda, he wasn't a Vatnik per se. He was a mouthpiece to a collective of people who are still fighting Gamergate who are trapped in the 2014 culture war and who perceive themselves as the noble warriors battling the cabal of liberal elites and their blue-haired psychopathic supporters. Whereas in reality, they're a bunch of angry people on the internet shadowboxing the background radiation of society, which they have been told, and for reasons only known to themselves, believe this is the biggest threat to the American way of life. As if trans people are somehow a threat to big trucks, Sunday barbecues, and watered-down beer. To them, the Ukraine war has simply become an extension of that 2014 culture war. The same cabal that ruined Ghostbusters by making all the lead characters female is now the same shadow government deep state puppeting the Zelensky regime. I should clarify that because there is a bit of a jump between Ghostbusters and supporting imperialism, though it's not as big a leap as you think. The Vatniks we know and love today are largely not actual serious Vatniks per se. They are contrarians, or people caught in the grip of what we call second wave opinionism. That is someone who believes that you, the person who goes along with the mainstream media narrative, are an idiot. You're a normie. You're a sheep. Unlike them, who chooses not to believe that narrative. Them, the red-pilled, independent, free-thinking, intellectually superior being, and thus above the common clay of society. And this thought of the mainstream media is held as sacrosanct above all else because so mired in its own rituals and its own culture that it's basically become its own religion, complete with initiation rituals and internal language and even loyalty tests. A person trapped within this culture cannot ever agree with the mainstream media narrative, even if that narrative is undoubtedly true. It has to seek alternatives regardless of how irrational or even insane those alternatives might be. It is naturally suspicious of anything that proves or supports the mainstream narrative and actively celebrates anything which confirms their current set of beliefs, regardless of evidence, as the real truth they don't want you to find. Because agreeing with the mainstream is grounds for all ostracizing you from the community. After all, if you agree with the mainstream version of events, then you just agree with what they want you to think. You're obviously blind to what the media is hiding from you. You're not as intelligent as we are, the real independent freethinkers of society who look beyond what the media tells you. But don't take our word in it, of course. You need to do your own research by reading the same books and sources that we do and ignoring all the ones we critique. So naturally, you'll come to the same conclusion as us. And if you don't, well then I guess 
guess you're just not smart enough to understand. Or you're in on it. You're actually part of the whole cabal trying to deceive us. Ha <laughs> ha! Nice try, shill propagandist. I'm right. I know I'm right. So for you to disagree, that must mean you are either stupid or you're part of it. Those are the only choices. I'm clearly not wrong. So are you ignorant or are you just evil? To people like that, politics has become less about things like water rates or taxation or the cost of parking in inner cities and how this chokes out small businesses. Instead, it's all about one thing, owning the libs. Whatever the libs want, we want the opposite. This is why the most popular politicians on the right have gone from promising tax cuts to whining about gender roles and promising to end wokeism whatever that is. There is no rational thought here. There is no critique. There is no analysis. There is no skepticism. It is simply current thing bad. Therefore, I support the opposite of the current thing, because unlike you lot, I am not a sheep. Zelensky current thing, current thing bad. Therefore, you must support the opposite of the current thing which is Russia, which is how this movement went from accusing the left of calling everyone they don't like a Nazi to supporting a man who calls everyone he doesn't like a Nazi. The true paragon of Western values, Vladimir Putin, the man who has vowed to destroy the West and what he calls its poisonous and decadent values, with what exact Western values Putin hates so much being completely undefined, so you can be led to believe whatever you want that to mean. And because this is in itself a paradox, and on a more superficial level, Russia has been so inept at handling this invasion, losing more than it could ever hope to gain from a successful conquest, in a war that has been a daily showcase of Russian feelings, as this three-day special military operation enters its third year, because the entirety of the Ukrainian front didn't immediately collapse after Bakhmut fell, as Russian territorial gains are being measured in inches, not miles, and the million-strong army with its hundreds of Su-57 fighter jets and T-14 Armata tanks fails to materialize for a second winter, the Vatniks need that constant supply of justification. That constant stream that, even as the list of Russian war crimes continues to extend, tells them that they are the good guys and what they are doing is right. Something we call copium. Copium is basically a justification high. It's a perfect cocktail of Russian propaganda, misinformation, willful ignorance, strawman arguments, and reheated conspiracy theories left over from the 90s that present enough of a consistent fog that the consumer never needs to deal with the fact that their beliefs are consistently disproven by reality. Because the second it does, they've already moved on to the next great argument, and have forgotten what you just said. Because that fog, that minutia, that Copium comes in such massive quantities so quickly and is stated with such confidence that through sheer volume alone, it becomes persuasive. It's nonsensical and almost comedic to an outside observer, but because there is so much of it that to the believer, to the contrarian, the sheer volume alone becomes evidence of the fact by itself. Ain't no smoke without fire. That means they just need to keep pushing forward without ever really having to question their beliefs. There's always another argument, always another thing. You just keep changing topics until your opponent is exhausted and then sit back thinking you've won. But because the sheer amount of information is in itself supremely overwhelming, the majority requires someone else to read it all for them and then summarize, preferably in a hundred words or less. And this is where the grifters come in. And there are so so many of them. Because surprisingly enough, if you want to boost your failing political career or even use the movement to steer people into hurting your political opponents, if you want to sell Z-branded merchandise or sell your book or promote your blog or your podcast or even your YouTube channel and suckle up that sweet, sweet sponsor revenue, as well as make thousands in donations and Patreon pledges, then there is a lot, and I mean a lot, of money to be made in being a Vatnik. Lyra wasn't a journalist. He was a grifter, pure and simple. His motivations to remain in the game were never political or ideological. He was in it for the ego, and he was in it for the money. He started out in 2010 as a self-published economics advisor, where he was described as someone who would refashion themselves into an expert in whatever topic was trending that day for attention. And when that attention ran dry, he would just jump to the next issue. He would leapfrog from community to community, issue to issue, famously rebranding himself as Coach Redpill and inserting himself into the Manosphere, or the Seduction Community, to give it its proper term. And this is where he would learn the art of copium. 
The seduction community is a hotbed for con artists to scam desperately lonely men with self-published books, games and even courses, all on how to seduce women. Of course, very few of those tips and tricks actually work because, well, women are also human with fickle and complicated minds and not a puzzle box in which the magic set of words unlocks the pussy. And what works for a six foot tall, dark skinned man in his early 20s with chiseled features, abs and a Porsche might not exactly work for a guy 200 pounds overweight with acne scars. So like all good scams, an excuse has to be made to show that neither you or the scammer are at fault. Clearly, it's the women. They're not sleeping with you, not because they can do better and the tricks that you're employing just make you come over as weird and creepy. It's because women are shallow and vain and too stupid to see the true alpha male breeder that you are. And this is the scam. To offer hope for sale to the desperate and to offer excuses as to why it isn't working by directing their target's anger at others. And then sell you more courses, more advice and more whatever later on down the line. All of which constantly reinforces that sweet, sweet nectar that everyone wants so much in life that every failing in your life is someone else's fault. It's not your fault you can't get laid, women are just vain. It's not your fault you didn't get into university, they just give priority space to black people. It's not your fault you didn't get that good job, the company had to give it to the diversity hire. It's not your fault Trump didn't win, it's the liberal elite cabal. It's not the fault of Russia that they are losing this war. None of the predictions we made were false or bad. None of the analysis we gave was wrong or inaccurate because it was based on factually dubious Russian propaganda. It's because NATO are throwing everything at Russia, and Russia is holding back, waiting for the perfect moment when NATO finally exhausts themselves to strike. It could win tomorrow. It will win tomorrow. Just keep watching, keep subscribing, keep listening, keep sharing our tweets, keep giving us attention, and keep believing. But this kind of belief has no foundation in reality. There is no secret wave of T-14 tanks just across the horizon. There is no evidence that Russia can sustain the losses that it is currently suffering without ramifications. It simply persists because, to the Vatniks, it would just be nice if that were true and they would rather believe it than face reality. And the shame that they may have been fooled. It's a disinformation confidence game. It's a con that promises people that, in the end, everyone on this side side of the line will be proven correct and right and get their just desserts. And because it's just assumed the desired outcome is inevitable, anything that happens in the middle, happening now, doesn't matter. So you can ignore it. You can ignore the multitude of failed counteroffenses or the fact that Russia is reactivating old tanks and equipment from the 1950s to offset their losses. Just stay focused on the inevitable end. We promise it'll be worth it. It's definitely going to happen. Everyone else on that side of the line, they're going to be eating humble pie and forced to kiss your feet because you were right the whole time. Russia will win and then all the dominoes will fall into place, even if all the evidence currently concludes that even if Russia does win, it will be a pariah victory at best and simply be the end of part one, the easy part of a war that could drag on at least another 20 years. This kind of contradictory, utterly delusional style of thought, all wrapped up in newspeak, works because it's easier for everyone trapped in the net of this con game to just keep rolling the dice than it is to ever admit that they have been fooled. Because, well, that's just embarrassing, and facing the embarrassment of being wrong and the ridicule that comes from it is truly a difficult thing to face. One of the hardest, most grown up, and quite possibly most mature things you can ever do in your life is admitting when you're wrong. Knowing when it's time to back off, to apologize, and when to just walk away from the table. And some people will just never mature to that level, so they just keep rolling the dice, they keep playing the game, in the hope that one day they will be proven right all along and never have to face that shame. Lyra was an artist of that game. The vast majority of the pro-Russian crowd are. They sell copium, so the Vatniks never have to fear shame. The difference being that Lyra was, and there's no real easy way of getting around this, unbelievably stupid. He played the game, but he was not good at it. He was far too volatile, far too unpleasant. He was incredibly uncharismatic. He would argue with his own supporters continuously. He was an awful debater, worse than me, and that is saying something. And as time went on, his rants became increasingly incoherent. He also began to believe his own bullshit to the point where it blinded him to things like common sense or his own well-being. And for that struggle, for that fight that he went through, he was rewarded with a cold and lonely death. 
because to the other grifters running this con, he was only ever a tool to amplify themselves. Someone you could bring on to your podcast, or fill a guest slot, or use his audience to boost your own, or push your little failing political career. But when the ship sinks, the rats will be the first to flee. Dombash Devushka, a Russian girl live reporting on Ukrainian war crimes from the Donbass, who later turned out to be Sarah Bills, a 30-year-old American-born fish tank salesman living in Washington State who had never been to Ukraine, and was quite literally just making shit up to promote her Z-branded merchandise store as well as donation campaigns, with no evidence of any of the money ever being handed over to any of the units or charities she claimed to support, was arrested and questioned by the FBI for her part and the intelligence leak. Allegedly, in order to save herself a lengthy prison time, she supposedly began leaking information about the other Vatniks in the inner circles that she operated in, including giving up the location of one Gonzalo Lira. He was arrested a few days later. Briefly on this, I know he was arrested living in Ukraine, and people have just assumed he was there the whole time. Okay, so the story I was told was when he was arrested the first time for selling pictures and locations of Ukrainian defensive positions to someone online, he gave up the names of the people he was working with in exchange for a lesser sentence, which led to the arrest of supposedly five Russian spies, or more likely fifth columnists. He was then given two options, but one was be deported, or the other be placed under house arrest and await trial. He chose house arrest, but became so paranoid that Russian assassins were out to get him as revenge for giving up those names that he changed his mind and asked to be deported. He was escorted by local police who bought him lunch to the train station and presumably left the country. I always assumed this to be true because when I was debating him and he claimed to be living in Kharkiv, there was actually a power cut when he was live, and well, he didn't suddenly get cut off. I mean, even if his building had its own generator, where was he getting the internet from? If he later returned to Ukraine or just pretended to leave is unknown to me. He had multiple homes in Ukraine and could have been using any one of them, so may not have experienced that exact power cut and may have just told me he was living in Kharkiv out of paranoia that I might just be able to guess his address. But anyway, there were calls for Lira's release when he was arrested a second and then later third time, but that was all largely contained on Twitter and only ever used as a means of throwing shade at President Biden. There were no real attempts to campaign for his release, and in prison, Lira received no visitors, no phone calls, no letters of support, no care packages, or financial aid to hire a lawyer. He even had to pay his own bail. I was actually in the early stages of talks with the Ukrainian Justice Department into getting an interview with Lyra, and as far as I've been told, I was the only person to make an inquiry as to his health and his well-being. And when he was released and made his mad dash across the country, seeking asylum in Hungary, live streaming it the whole way, he did so on a bicycle. No one came to pick him up or help smuggle him out of the country, something that many of the Vatniks with their connections could have easily done. In fact, shortly after the buzz about his arrest died down, the other grifters began to turn on him. Former UN weapons inspector, twice convicted pedophile, and 100% non-biased news reporter and definitely not fifth columnist himself, Scott Ritter, seen here delivering a speech to Russian troops earlier this year, called him out as a double agent, claiming he had been spying for the Ukrainians the whole time. In death, his name has been on everyone's lips once again. The crocodile tears have come rolling, but again, it's all a performance, all a pantomime. His death is used to push whatever narrative the grifters want to sell you, and when the buzz dies down, he will be promptly forgotten. His life and death will only ever be used to promote the Zelensky bad narrative. You'll never hear people talking about his hobbies, his favourite brand of coffee, or what he was like as an actual person, because all of those things are unimportant. They cannot be used to push the narrative. No one even knows what those things are, because no one cared about Gonzalo Lira, and in death he has simply become part of the fog of copium that surrounds the Vatniks. He was used for clout, and promptly discarded when he was squeezed dry. And when the narrative changes when Ukraine is no longer a hot-button topic and the contrarians all move on, Lira will be forgotten. And for a man who wished me a painful death, that's all I can really say about him. I'm not going to pretend that I respect the man now that he's dead. But I will say this. Gonzalo Lira had three homes in Ukraine, none of which were seized by the government. He had ample funds available to him. He had a monthly income, which at one point was more than I had in savings. He was in a comfortable position. Ukraine has other priorities right now. It has an overbloated justice system, which is underfunded and more focused on corruption issues. It would have taken years before Lira saw a trial date. They released him on bail because they just didn't consider him a threat. They even returned his phone. All he had to do 
was sit on his ass in his house, doing whatever he wanted. Or if he really felt threatened, walk into the Hungarian embassy and just ask for asylum. But that would mean being quiet and behaving. And he wanted attention. He wanted to be in prison. He reveled at the idea of being in prison because that made the narrative all about him being this lone soldier fighting corruption on the front lines, trying to get the truth out to the masses or being hunted and suppressed each step of the way for daring to question the Zelensky regime, rather than him him just being a sex tourist who was quite frankly out of his depth. Ukraine did not kill Gonzalo Lira. Lira's own stupidity, his own ego, is what killed him. And my only hope is that in his final moments, when he realised he was alone and going to die, his thoughts finally turned to what tree he would have liked to be.